Good morning again for the 17th time. My name is Michael Peterson. I just want to thank Aaron and Sheila for giving me this opportunity, but most importantly, God. Let's pray before we get into the word. God, we just want to thank you so much for today, God, for waking us up this morning, God, for your kingdom and the opportunity to have a relationship with you, God. I pray right now that you just step into this space, into my heart, into my spirit, God, and to only allow me to say what you want me to say, that you move powerfully through these words, your words, to move your people closer to you. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we talked about, the Petersons happen to be a family of bakers. I bake, Jasmine bakes. And it's interesting with baking that if you were to add or take away a teaspoon of anything, the entire recipe is off. Now, with cooking nine times out of ten, you can save the dish with some seasoning, some salt, some pepper. But baking is not like that. It's a very specific art. It's very scientific, actually. There are food scientists that study this subject. And I, as I bake, I, there are certain recipes where I don't really need a cookbook anymore because I've done it so many times. I know the exact measurements. I could do it in my sleep. But then there are those times when I want to try something new. And I, I need a cookbook because <laughs> I don't know that recipe and I don't know it by heart. I got to a lot of times watch a YouTube video. I'm like, Let, I need to see how you do this. How do you put that cup in there? How do you whisk it? For how long? Because I have no idea what that recipe requires. And I remember a time in my life a few years ago where I was so desperate for repentance and change. I was begging God for a different Michael. Day in and day out, I just was tired of the me I was currently in. I needed a new recipe. And I remember after digging into God's word, I had discovered this, this recipe of repentance. That I had added in a cup of this and a dash of that, and a new Michael began to emerge. And recently, I've been thirsty again. And I found my pla myself in a place of desperation again. Because now the new Michael's become the old Michael. And this old Michael can't stay. And I, I, I wrote this, this sermon with a lot of tears because repentance is not easy. It's emotional and it's hard, but it's necessary. And so the title of today's lesson is The Recipe of Repentance. Point number one is a teaspoon of spiritual sorrow. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 7.10. It's interesting because I saw a quote recently a few days ago about repentance not being when you cry. And a part of me felt like, uh, true but not true, right? Because part of the, those tears is a sign of brokenness. And brokenness is essential for repentance. So in 2 Corinthians 7.10, the Bible reads, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. And I always was wondering, what is this worldly sorrow? You see, worldly sorrow is hopelessness. Worldly sorrow is that pit where you finally give in to the lie that you can't change. And so you repeatedly do the thing that you hate doing because you don't actually believe that God could change you. But see, moving forward, in verse 11, it says, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. You see, some of those words might be a little off-putting, so I, I looked up the synonyms and I inserted them in. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What sincerity, what excitement to clear yourselves. What anger towards your sin, what shock, what desire, what concern, what urgency to see justice done. You see, all these things are byproducts of a godly sorrow, but the word sorrow is still there. Why would God want me to feel sorrowful? 
because he wants you to participate in what he feels about what you've done. Because some people in this room are married, but before you made a vow to your spouse, you made a vow to God. And when you sin, it is betrayal. It is an adultery to your covenant to God. You see, a lot of times we tell ourselves that it's not that serious because we don't want to feel the weight of that. And yet it is necessary for your soul to feel the weight of that so that you could be broken. But what does that look like? Let's turn our Bibles to Luke 18. You see, this is one of my favorite scriptures to read, but one of the hardest ones for me to read. We're going to start in Luke 18, verse 9. Let me get an amen when you guys are there. Luke 18, verse 9, it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, sometimes that's what we do with ourselves. We start to negotiate with ourselves about how bad our sin is. I, I cuss, but I'm not a murderer. I fell into immorality, but I'm not a child molester. And so you start to justify your sin and take away the, the weight that's needed to break your heart. But this man couldn't even look up to God to pray. Is that your response to your sin? Or are you constantly having conversations with yourself, trying to talk yourself out of this brokenness that you need? It's a heavy weight to, to look at you in the mirror, to look at your sin in the mirror and to take ownership of it. Because a lot of us in the midst of our sin will want to do more things. I messed up so I'll serve more. I messed up so I'll, I'll show up even earlier to church. This Pharisee named all the things that he was doing. But he wasn't being anything. And so he was consumed with, if I just do religious things, I can have a relationship with God. And that is not what repentance is. Repentance, as my wife explained, metanoia... It is a change of mind to agree with God. You see, if God says that your sin is bad, your sin is bad. If God said that there is no man alive that is good, why are you still trying to convince yourself that you are a good person? And this is the conversation, but yet when you allow yourself to step into that sorrow, to feel it as God feels it, then you can begin the process to move towards godly sorrow, which will produce repentance. You see, crying just to cry is one thing, but crying in sight of the cross and realizing that now your sin made the cross required and that Jesus had to now come down for that one decision, crying for that is a different cry. It's a sobering cry. It's a broken cry. And in Psalm 51, David said, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. And so we must allow ourselves to be broken so that we could be made whole. Point number two is three tablespoons of brainwashing. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts 3, 19. Hello? <laughs> I was this silent as a cemetery in here this morning. It's just me, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, y'all. Acts 3.19. 
The Bible reads in Acts 3.19, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the metanoia, the repent, the change of mind. You see, meta is the root word that we get for metamorphosis, which we know means to change, or for metabolism, which is defined as your body being, the rate at your body is able to change food into energy and nutrients. Change, metanoia is the mind. And so you have to ask yourself, do I, do I agree with God? Am I unified with God? This is why we have a whole Bible study on the Word of God, which is, do I, my, does my life line up to what the Bible calls me to do? And if not, then in Hebrews 4.12, the Word is sharper than any double-edged sword. I have to allow the Bible to cut that part out. But see, it's the cutting that's the painful part. Because it's the, the cutting of, this is all I've ever known. This is all I'm comfortable with. This is all I've been safe with with my whole entire life and so whenever times got hard i just would go back to impurity because impurity was the pressure release from my week i i would go to work and i would go to the bar or i would i would have a crazy week and i would just ha i would have my friend that's a girl who's not really my girlfriend but she thinks that's my girlfriend but really she's just a side chick because i just use her for what i need it's that comfort that really I should be getting from God, but I need something physical. I need the now. Because getting it from God takes too much effort. I got to wait for that. And so even in my own self, I've been looking at my habits and my thought patterns. What am I reaching towards? Because a lot of the times it may not be up, but out and to the side and even down. And so you have to be able to say, if I have these habits, I got to allow the Bible as painful as it, as it may be. Because a lot of us want the anesthetic. If you're going to if you're going to cut it out, God, put me to sleep. Numb me out. But if you would simply stay woke for that process and allow God to cut that out of you. But it's a painful process because you are awake the entire time. Surgeries take hours to finish, sometimes even a whole day of just precise cutting and movement and all these things. And there's, there's multiple people in the room for a surgery. You can't fix you because you didn't make you. You are ill-equipped to fix you. If I, have ther if I have internal issues, why would I call a plumber to sit down and have a therapy session with? But you think you can fix you. If you're having problems with your car, you're not going to bring it to me. All I'm going to do is pull up Google Maps and type in AutoZone. <laughs> you could borrow my phone for Google Maps. That's all I got for you because I have nothing for you to help you in that scenario. I'm ill-equipped. I don't have the skills or the knowledge to help you in that scenario. And so we have to have a sobriety about our humanity before God. And so we, we got we to gotta see things differently and be humble enough to stop trying to name the things that we're doing and start naming the things that we're not. That's why when Jesus says in Luke 11, 1 through 4, hallowed be your name, as you pray, you start to recognize how much God is God and how human you are. God is not just his name and his position in the universe. He is God, King of kings, Lord of lords. He spoke and things are still in existence from the time that he said, let there be light. Look outside. Is there light? You have to recognize who God is. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs 1, 23. Proverbs 1, 23. Let me get an amen when you guys are there. The Bible reads in Proverbs 1, 23. If you had responded 
to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. You see, God is waiting to give you his thoughts if you would repent. You can't agree with God if you don't have a mind like God. And he says, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. You cannot understand God and be in a uh, chosen sin. You cannot be living in complete disobedience to God and still think that he's going to reveal himself to you. You will stay knowing only a small percentage of the God you claim to love and yet your heart, your life hates. This is a hard truth that no one likes to talk about because churches would be empty. And I believe that it's not so much that specific sins that stunt a church's growth, it's the refusal to repent. Because everyone has sinned. It, all of us right now have already sinned today. And if we're going to base what God can do through all of us, well, baby, it's just going to be us. I'm be looking at Kamani until I'm 75, like, we're, we're still here. <laughs> but I believe that God refuses to move because people refuse to move back to God. And so we sit in deep times arguing with the person that God's put in our life to help us change because we don't want to be cut. We want to keep our comfort. And we want to keep our ignorance. Because ignorance is bliss. And we want to stay inside this box where we're just loving God. But we must be changed. God has so many different versions of yourself on the opposite side of your repentance. Would you be content with eating the same meal for the rest of your life? Just oatmeal. No butter, no sugar. Just oatmeal. Why not? It's nutritious. Gives you energy to make it through your day. You're like, oh, I, I need variety. I need this. I need that. I need this kind of flavor. God feels the same way about you. He said, you keep serv serving me this old Michael oatmeal. I'm tired of eating this oatmeal. Why don't you give me something different? And so we have to complete this recipe so that we can present God a new version of ourselves. God, I made this dish. It's going to blow your mind. That's exciting. When I try a new recipe and it's good, I can't wait to share it. I'm going to give it out. I'm just like, just come to my house and you can just taste this new thing I made. And so I'm excited to present a new Michael to God. <laughs> Point number three, four cups of fear of the Lord. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans 125. You see, as the Bible, it's a, it's a very extensive book. And it really can be a rabbit hole. But as you dive into certain concepts, you start to see the realities that you once may have not known. And sometimes we see people have to live out certain consequences of their sin. And yet there are times when it has nothing to do with a certain person, but really it's God that has actually stepped in. Romans 1, starting in verse 24 says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with, one, with other men 
and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God hates God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do the very things, they also approve of those who practice them. You see, it says that God gave them over. If you want your sin that bad, God will step back and let you have it. You see, there's a buffer called the Holy Spirit. And it is under submission to God. You see, just as there's roles in a marriage, there are roles within the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the two, Spirit and Son, live in submission to God the Father. So God says, step back and let them have it. It says that God gave them over. I've experienced this in my own walk with God. There are consequences for what we choose to do over and over and over again. God is a gentleman. He will not force you to love him. Because we won't force anyone to love us. And so God says, okay. You can have it. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians 2.9. 2 and as I continue to make this sermon, my gratitude for those who decide to stand in the pulpit and to teach was immensely tripled because, as I said, I, there were tears I made this sermon because of, partly was it because it was fear. Because I now stand doubly accountable to God for the things I say to you this morning. And so you can feel like leaders are X, Y, and Z, but they're doubly accountable to God to help you in your walk with God. And this, this is a scary thing to talk about, fear of the Lord, because there's only more fear that you can get. There, there is no like, I am now 100% fearful of God. No, you're not. I, I, can, I promise you you're not. 2 Thessalonians 2.9. The Bible reads, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every sort of evil, of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. This is not a happenstance. God has now taken action. This is a scary thing for God to decide, I'm now going to allow you to believe it. Not only can you have it, but you will not be able to turn back. And for myself, I, I had to ask myself, Michael, are you, are you abusing today? That you are in your right mind. That you have not been given over to depravity. Do you know what it's like to view a, dep a depraved mind? Have any of us seen any zombie movies? That is a physical representation of depravity. They can't speak. And yet we see people who are spiritually depraved and remain unmoved. And think, I'll never be there. They're doing the most. God, I'm so glad I'm not like that guy. I watched a movie recently called Beautiful Boy about a young man, 18 years old, with a meth addiction. And I watched how his father tried to save him and his mother tried to save him. And this boy 
and the writers did such a good job because he, he spoke not to his addiction, but his emptiness. He said, when I finally took the drug, I felt like it had filled the hole that I always felt inside of myself. And the more I took, the more I needed because the bigger the hole got. And I was watching it with Jasmine and I cried because I said, I relate to that young man. Because it, his addiction doesn't matter. It's his emptiness that I could relate with. It's the fact that he was in desperate need of something and he didn't even know that he needed God. And so he was chasing after this substance, even though it's hurt himself, it's hurt his family, it's hurt all the relationships that he ever had. He still felt like he needed this thing because it was the only thing that he had access to at that point in time. It was the only thing he could get his hands on quick enough to stop the pain. And so there was no fear because all there was was the taste of thirst in his mouth his pain, his desperation. And yet we can be in those places and see people in those places and stand in judgment instead of compassion. Not, re not recognizing that we have the same thirst in our own throats at the same time. But we're just choosing a different drink. And so the fear, for our, the fear of the Lord is not just for ourselves, but it's for other people. We have to fear God on behalf of other people's souls and be moved. I'm going to turn our Bibles to Genesis 25. We're going to look at the story of Esau. I want you to turn to Genesis 25, 19, but also put a finger into Hebrews 12, verse 16. We're going to get through this quickly. Y'all still with me? I love y'all. This is, this, is, this, is, this is a hard one. No one likes their personal trainer while they're training, right? But when your body looks right, that's your favorite person, okay? Genesis 25, 19. Are we all there? It says, this is the account of Abraham's sons, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, and Aramean, from Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Arame Aramean. Excuse me. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. They were twins. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. The two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, the, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from open country famished. He saw Jacob, quick, let me have some of the red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Now let's flip over to Hebrews 12, 16. Hebrews 12, 16, the Bible reads, See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. He could not bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You see, sometimes your repentance has an expiration date. Esau sought repentance with tears. And it was not granted to him because 
for a moment he sold his birthright. I'm a birthright seller. Time and time again. And I'm grateful that I have not lost my mind because it was possible for me. And so I stand to warn you and myself that we cannot continue to sell this birthright because we have expiration dates. And God is gracious, but when his grace is abused, when he sees his son's blood trampled, God will act on his behalf. God will defend Jesus' honor against us as the adopted children. And so how, how is one to move forward from these things? And I prayed, God, how do I myself move forward from these things? And it's point number four, which is a spoonful of desire. Let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 37, 4. You see, we've, we've heard that God will give them over to their desires. And so what needs to be fixed is not just the mind, but the desire. And in Psalm 37, 4, the Bible reads, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, a lot of us have read this scripture as, if I delight in my, myself in the Lord, he'll give me the things that I already want. No, 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 no. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he will impart into you, he will place inside of you the desires of your heart. And so the only way for you to have your repentance be longstanding is to have a heart transplant. Now that is when the surgery comes in. Because if your desires can change, the byproducts of your life and your choices will change. Let's turn our Bibles to James 1.14. This is our last scripture. Let me get an amen when you guys are there. James 1.14. Let's start in verse 13. It says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone? But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. You see, desire is the beginning stages. And yet your destiny is predicated upon the desires that we live out. So if you want a different life, you need a different desire. And how do you get a different desire? You must delight yourself in the Lord. And you cannot delight yourself in the Lord if you disagree with him. If you do not fear him. And so you must be broken by what God is broken about. You must be angry what God is angry about. You must fear him as God. Fear him as God and Lord, and then as you delight yourself in the Lord, your desires will be transferred to what he gives you. And so as my desires began to shift, I started to see a different Michael appear. And whoever's been here for a few years, you saw him appear as well. It was like a flower, just like. <laughs> what the? Those are the bad weeks, right? It was like, oh, Lord, okay, I just got to keep going, right? <laughs> but there are times and in, in moments, days, weeks, months, even years in our walks with God when we feel like, God, I just can't do this. You become convinced that you're just not that person. That you're the exception to the Holy Spirit. But see, you have to choose to be the Esau. You see, 
God gave us something so powerful that he does not control himself, and it is our will. God, when he made us in his image, he said, I'm going to give you what I have already have myself, which is the power to choose. You need no authority from God or any human being to make a choice. And in that, you are like God. To, and he gave us that so that we would choose to be like him. Or we could, like the Pharisee, try to do things similarly to God, but not actually being like God. And so today, you have two choices, and there's already a conversation that you've begun in your own mind. And I'm looking in some of your eyes, and I'm excited because I, I see some of you have already decided, I'm going to change. But I want to speak to the person that has yet to believe. And John 8, 31, to the Jews who believed, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings. You see, today you believe, but tomorrow you'll be tested. And so tomorrow, you're going to have to remember today. You're going to have to look back only to remember the commitment that you made today. And as you start to work out your repentance, you have to remember that your conversion is not an easy thing because your salvation happened in a second. You went down and then you came up, but your conversion lasts a lifetime. And so as you work out this repentance, do not do it alone. Get the surgeons and the nurses in your surgery room. Phone a friend and get into the Bible because it is the only roadmap and it has the only recipe for true repentance. I love you guys so much, and to God be the glory.